Welcome to the Spring 2021 edition of UHM TV, a TV news magazine show written, hosted, and produced by the journalism students here at UH Manoa. I'm Elizabeth Ufi. And I'm Sammy Jo Saxon. Thanks for joining us from our brand new College of Social Sciences Digital Studios. Coming up in this episode, how Hawaii is moving towards its 100% renewable energy goal, and how that could mean bigger savings for consumers. Meet young, sustainable entrepreneurs who are making the green by keeping it green. Catch up with the UH men's basketball team as they reflect on past COVID challenges and what it takes to get back on top. Plus, an exclusive talk story session with proud UH alum and former football warrior, Honolulu Mayor Rick Blangiardi. Stay with us for this next edition of UHM TV. First, we want to start by congratulating all the graduates from the class of 2021. While traditional commencement ceremonies have been canceled because of COVID safety guidelines, UH officials were able to offer a hybrid celebration in person and online. Captured moments can be found online at the Manoa commencement website. The College of Social Sciences also held its first virtual Aloha celebration that is now posted on our college website. CSS students got a chance to record their own Zoom shoutouts while receiving special video messages from their professors and Dean Denise Conan. Congrats to the outstanding graduating senior and CSS student ambassador Cindy Ng, who also served as student speaker. Mahalo to Manu Boyd and dancer Pono Fernandez for sharing a special oli and hula for the celebration. Congrats again to the class of 2021. While UH is doing its best to reduce its electricity costs, more help may be on the way to do just that. As Liam Thropp reports, a new regulation issued by Public Utilities Commission could force Hawaiian Electric to slash monthly bills for all customers. The University of Hawaii has been actively making campus greener through new solar energy projects on Manoa campus buildings. The most recent parking lot solar canopy project is estimated to save UH $100,000 a year in energy costs. This is part of UH Manoa's effort to be net zero by 2035, 10 years ahead of the state goal. We, we're, we have to go net zero by law and policy, and yet we have to preserve our historical buildings by law. So which one is it going to be, right? Despite challenges, UH Manoa strives to have 5 megawatts of solar paneling to power campus by 2025, an amount capable of powering nearly 3,000 homes. Sinclair Library was one of the first buildings to install solar paneling on the Manoa campus back in 2012. This small project took off campus-wide as more solar paneling was installed over the past decade, with projected energy savings for the university of up to $8 million. Meanwhile, Hawaiian Electric is working to install better, sustainable infrastructure across Oahu to help make energy more efficient and affordable for residential customers. In December 2020, Hawaii's Public Utilities Commission released new guidelines for HECO to drop electricity rates by June of 2021. Because we are so dependent on petroleum for our electric generation, solar is actually a lot cheaper, so that helps bring bills down. The PUC will reward HECO $2 million for its effort to cut costs, help low-income communities, and improve customer service. The new plan will return $2 million in customer dividends in 2021 and is expected to rise to more than $11 million by 2025. Currently, the average electric bill in Hawaii runs about $150 a month, but that could be lowered as early as this summer. To see extra savings, HECO suggests using surge protectors, replacing light bulbs with energy efficient options, and limiting air conditioner usage during the hot summer months. For UHM TV, I'm Liam Throb. Thanks, Liam. During the pandemic, many local farmers and ranchers have been struggling with mass production and high shipping costs. Now, lawmakers are proposing more funding to encourage local businesses to buy and sell homegrown products, including 100% grass-fed beef. 
Kualo Ranch is world famous for its Hollywood movie scenes, but it's also a vibrant working ranch that produces local grass-fed beef, pork, and 60 crop varieties. Shipping costs and product scarcity is increasing the price for food. Buying local is both sustainable and reliable during a time of crisis, as seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly 90% of Oahu's food products are imported from the mainland, making it more expensive for consumers and local ranchers want to cut those costs. We sell, I would say, 99% of our beef straight out of our market here. And so I don't know if you remember, but over here, meat got super expensive. And we were all of a sudden cheaper than anybody. And people were telling us that. They're like, what, five bucks a pound for ground beef? But it was because it was $9 a pound at the store because there was a shortage. Because of the COVID crisis, ranchers are facing a 46% increase in shipping cattle off-island. A lot of them want to be able to keep more cattle here in Hawaii for local consumption. But that has to be a good business decision. In order to run a viable business, ranchers need to have enough land to support grass-fed beef, access to affordable transportation, and sufficient processing plants. The Department of Agriculture is offering nearly $2 million in mini-grants for small-scale farmers and ranchers to increase local food security. Although it may cost more to produce local agriculture, farmers encourage residents to consider buying and growing local. I think what I would ask the community to do is to remain deliberately minded about the value of local. And so if you see value in buying local and supporting your own food sustainability, there is value there, and you have to find it inside yourself to assign that value to something that's worth it to you. Ag producers are hoping new laws will help keep our local livestock here at home. For UHMTV, I'm Sammy Jo Sexton. Over the last 30 years, more than half of the world's coral has died due to climate change and overfishing. Now, lawmakers are proposing to fund a new concept known as reef insurance to pay for coral restoration and research. Kalia Natividad has more. Coral is integral to the ocean's ecosystem and is an invaluable resource for places like Hawaii. Researchers estimate that healthy corals protect more than $800 million worth of Hawaii's infrastructure from flood damage every year. Now, lawmakers are advocating for reef insurance in the state, a relatively new concept that would help fund the conservation and restoration of Hawaii's reefs. A recent report from the Nature Conservancy shows 20 years of changes in West Maui's marine life. Parts of the reefs are doing better than others, and this information can help with management, both to reduce threats and to preserve areas that are doing well. Researchers at the Gates Coral Lab studied corals that bleached in the mass bleaching event of 2015. They found that some are less susceptible than others. According to Dr. Ty Roach, bleaching causes corals to be at a major loss of energy. If they stay like that long enough, the corals will eventually die. And this can, of course, scale up through other levels of the ecosystem um, and eventually lead to collapse of fisheries or the entire uh, ecosystem as a whole. The mass bleaching of 2015 was driven in part by the El Nino event that year. 2015, that El Nino event drove water temperatures up all over the Pacific Ocean. They were tagging the corals, which ones bleached and which ones didn't. What we found is actually that the fats in those corals, these specific lipids called betaine lipids, were very different between the corals that had bleached and the corals that had not bleached. Moving forward, conservationists can use this information to select corals that will be more resilient when outplanting reefs. We want to see if there's other types of corals that have these lipids. Happy to, to contact anyone um, from your university who might be interested in helping. For more information or to volunteer, please contact the Gates Coral Lab. For UHM-TV, I'm Kalia Natividad. Cage-free shark dives are a popular attraction among tourists and Oahu residents alike. But as Sophia Compton reports, some ocean experts question how safe these dives really are. Shark ecotourism is a big business in Hawaii, with companies offering both cage and cage-free shark dives. But critics worry that the industry is unregulated and some commercial businesses may not be operating safely. There's no oversight, no certification of their education programs. As far as I know, there's no formal training of those people. In the last decade, there have been about 90 shark attacks in Hawaii with five fatalities. Some ocean experts believe that unsafe practices such as chumming or attracting sharks with bait can disturb the ecosystem, 
often leading to unnatural patterns and possibly aggressive shark behaviors. Some dives operate in an enclosed cage, while others allow divers to swim freely in close contact with the sharks. Cage-free diving is a little, I think it's risky. If you're prepared to take that risk, okay. One Ocean Diving offers cage-free shark tours on Oahu's North Shore and promotes education and marine conservation. One Ocean Diving does not use any method to lure sharks and the team has to go through extensive training in order to be able to lead a dive. So we go through pretty intensive training. Uh, we need to make sure that we know all the behavior of the animals, the behavior of the sea, the behavior of the other animals besides the sharks. Uh, so it's been months long. In Hawaiian culture, the shark is considered a sacred aumakua, which is a family god or guardian. Experts point out that sharks are predators and need to be treated with care and respect. I've had it quite literally happen where a guy reached out and tried to grab the shark's tail. And just like you wouldn't do that to a stray dog, you definitely shouldn't do that to a wild animal that you don't know personally. Uh, with us, we spend years and months and weeks and days and hours, you know, uh, with these animals so we can kind of read them a bit more. Lawmakers want stricter regulations to require a permit for all tour companies, hire trained and certified dive masters, and limit tour groups to eight people. Although the measure did not pass this legislative session, advocates hope to raise the issue again next year. For UHM TV, I'm Sophia Compton. Sophia, for those interested in going on a shark dive, what should they know before choosing a tour company? It is important to understand that shark dive companies can operate without a permit. So make sure to do your research on the company that you are diving with and remember to be smart and respectful of the sharks in the water. Thanks, Sophia. When we return, find out how this ocean sanctuary is saving our seaweed. And how this sister duo is growing their local business by simply saving the planet. Stay with us for UHM TV. Congratulations, class of 2021. You have faced unimaginable challenges and risen above them with resilience, grace, and strength of character. As you begin the next stages of your life's journey, I encourage you to pause and listen to that inner voice that says, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. This is what I'll do. So open yourselves up to the new possibilities and perspectives raised by this voice. I could not be prouder of each and every one of you. Congratulations, class of 2021. It is an honor to welcome you to the College of Social Sciences alumni family. Wishing you the warmest aloha today and always. Welcome back to UHM TV. When it comes to good old fashioned local food, we normally think of fish and poi. And if you're lucky, limu, the Hawaiian word for seaweed. But as Charissa Porter tells us, the once thriving staple has declined dramatically over the years and is in desperate need of restoration. Tucked away in a remote area of Wamanalo Beach lies a sacred turtle pond known as Pohonu. It was built more than 800 years ago as a way to attract turtles to the area. Over the years, climate change, invasive species, and overcrowding have caused sea life and limu, otherwise known as seaweed, to diminish and the rock walls to fall apart. It was kind of in rumbles, it was in, in really bad shape. It started with uh, the Limabui wanting to take on that kuleana of uh, restoring the wall so that we could you know, plant Limu back into this space. Limu was a part of the ancient native Hawaiian diet and was also used for medicinal purposes as well as religious and cultural ceremonies. We started off, uh, we make Limu lays, with Limu that's got a lot of spores in it. Um, tied them to rocks, anchored them down, and we were placing them on what was the remnants of the old wall. State lawmakers have recently approved a resolution to name 2022 as the Year of the Limu. They hope it will recognize its important nutritional value while preserving Hawaii's ocean ecosystem and cultural knowledge. For more information, or if you would like to volunteer, visit waimanalolimuhui.org. For UHM TV, I'm Trissa Porter. Thanks, Trissa. Nearly 90% of goods in Hawaii are imported across distant seas. But as Aloha Lau tells us, a new movement launched by young entrepreneurs is hoping to change that statistic. 
so more locals can grow, sell, and buy local. Local business sister duo Rayma and Raina Wong are founders of Our Planet, which is a waste-free, cruelty-free, and plastic-free shop that strives to incorporate environmentally responsible practices into people's homes and daily lives. The Wong sisters are only 20 years old and are working to provoke change. A lot of people, I feel like our age, um, kind of see our business and what we've been able to do at such a young age, and that it's kind of just inspiring that we're all working together to do this um, and be a part of the solution. Trinity Singh is a young entrepreneur at just 19 years old who discovered her passion for sustainability while working for the Albizia project. You know, when you're passionate about something, you put a lot of effort, you put a lot of time and money and you are really careful about what you create. And I think that's what's beautiful about small businesses is they really care. Malka Market is a global platform that connects consumers to local artisans who utilize material which is ethically sourced and harvested to support regeneration of natural resources. Our Planet was featured at Malka Market's first pop-up and has grown so much after their first appearance. Like other businesses, Malka Market and Our Planet have been impacted by COVID-19. But through their hardships, they've been able to become resourceful and innovative. In the future, Malka Market has plans of developing their platform to an e-commerce business to share the products of local artisans and vendors on a global scale. For UHM TV, I'm Aloha Lau. When we come back, we'll talk story with a proud UH graduate turned politician, Mayor Rick Blangiardi, on set right after this. Every semester, we like to feature a notable UH alum who has made a difference in our community. Reporter Liam Throp recently sat down with Honolulu Mayor Rick Blangiardi to find out more about his extraordinary journey to Honolulu Hale. Rick Blangiardi is an accomplished TV executive with more than 40 years of leadership in the business. After working at several news stations in Hawaii and on the mainland, he eventually became the general manager of Hawaii News Now. Then in early 2020, he decided to make a huge career change and run for the city's top office. But before it all, he was a UH student, starting linebacker for the Warrior football team, and later served five seasons as a coach. In 2014, he was honored with a Distinguished UH Alumni Award and recently joined the ranks of the UH Hall of Fame in 2018. Today we are lucky to have newly elected mayor and a proud UH graduate, Rick Blangiardi, here with us in studio. Thanks for being with us, Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah, it's nice to be back on campus. Could you tell me a little bit about your early life and childhood? Well, thank you for asking. I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, far away from here, and grew up in a uh, bilingual household. Boston was a very ethnocentric town, so I lived in a place that was really like Little Italy, and did that until I was uh, 17 years old, and I went away to a prep school for the Naval Academy. Uh, and while I was there in the spring of 1965 is when I learned my father, who was a machinist, was gonna be transferred to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And that changed my destiny. I didn't wanna say no to my mom, but I came here in 1965. Could you tell us a little bit about how UH has shaped your career path? Well, UH has played a huge role in my life. Uh, you know, I came here at a very formative point in time when I was 18 years old to play uh, and, and you know, attend college. That's my first place I started. I was a freshman and, you know, in college here, and it really did shape And Even though despite the fact I had to leave for family reasons after a couple of years, I came back to it, you know. I came back to it and went to graduate school and then I had the privilege of working here. It's just been such a focal point of my life. So for me, I, 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 I don't know what more I could possibly do for this school, but I would be willing to do almost anything. It's always been about wanting to give back to this place that has given me so much. I really loved Hawaii so much and its people. I took a job in television sales at KGMB. I have no regrets and that led to a 43-year career which I retired from to run for mayor back in January of 2020. And did you always know that you wanted to be mayor of Honolulu? No. If you and I were doing this interview two years ago today and you said, look, I have a crystal ball here. Two years from now, you'll be the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. I said, Liam, get the wrong guy and let's step out of here. <laughs> the inspiration to do so really came about the latter part, actually in December of 2019. So a lot of people started talking to me, say, look, Rick, what else do you have left to prove in television? And I felt like I had a lot of, I still had a lot in my tank and I wanted to do something that really mattered. 
But, I, it's, but it's been wonderful. It's been exhilarating. And people say, God, are you tired? And I say, actually, it's just the opposite. I find it very energizing, even though I know it's going to take time to achieve some of the things we want to achieve. When you start talking about issues like homelessness or this incredible civil works project called the rail and all of its complications, or for that matter, of building of affordable housing that's been talked about forever, there's just, there's just a lot of major topics to deal with. So when you're faced with that, it's like we're on some kind of a mission here. <laughs> Look, it's 74 years old. I don't have any political aspirations. I ran on that. I, I knew that you know I didn't want to run as a politician. It wasn't even so much as a business guy. It was a guy who loved this place, who had a lot of leadership experience, who wanted to make a difference, who knew how to make a difference. As a UH graduate yourself, do you have any advice for those who are? Well, I would tell you, don't, don't try to predict the future, but it's about creating the future. And you do that by the choices you make and the alignments you seek. And right now, you've been aligned with the University of Hawaii as an undergraduate, very powerful, important alignment. And I can tell you as a former alum, that alignment will last you for the rest of your life. Mayor Rick, thank you so much for your time. We want to thank the viewers for joining us on this special edition for UHMTV. Coming up next, why UH grad students are lobbying to change the name of this university, Main Street. And how UH men's basketball team is keeping its eyes on the prize after coping with the COVID fallout. All that and more, only on UHMTV. UH Manoa's Main Street is named after a controversial figure in Hawaiian history and UH grad students are actively trying to restore its original name. But as Cassie Ordonia reports, funding and pushback from the Manoa neighborhood are just two roadblocks preventing that from happening. Dole Street is one of the university's main streets fronting the UH campus, but the graduate student organization says it's a controversial name that should be changed to reflect Native Hawaiian values. The street was named after Sanford B. Dole, one of the major leaders in Hawaii's overthrow of the monarchy. Students say the name is a painful reminder of historical injustice. It's really a big slap in the face to the Native Hawaiian community. Since 2017, GSO has been asking to change the name of Dole Street to its original Hawaiian name, Kapa'akea Street. But the Manoa Neighborhood Board opposed the measure, saying many residents complained of having to change their address. It was good for people to talk about the history, what it means. And we saw that with McKinley. Earlier this year, Hawaii State Teachers Association voted to change McKinley High School's name and remove the statue of President William McKinley, another controversial figure in Hawaiian history. But that effort failed. There was this argument that seemed kind of slippery slope about, well, if you rename McKinley, you have to rename everything. Under Honolulu law, changing the street name requires approval of affected property owners, the fire and police departments, and the U.S. Post Office. I'm confident that it's going to happen. Um, all it's going to take is just a little bit of time um, talking with people, getting to know each other and understanding where we're coming from. Graduate students hope to continue the conversation with key stakeholders and revisit the issue in the near future. For UHMTV, I'm Cassie Ordonio. Thanks, Cassie. Even though sidelined by COVID-19, the UH men's basketball team still has high hopes for a chance back on the championship court. As Matthew Vasconcellos reports, the Rainbow Warriors are in rebuilding mode and gearing up for another shot at a Big West Conference title. In 2016, the Rainbow Warrior men's basketball team was riding high with a 28-6 winning overall record, claiming its first championship in the Big West. Fast forward to 2021, when the Bows finished with a slim winning margin of 11-10. Head coach Aran Ganat attributes their loss of momentum from losing top players such as Justin Hemsley and Justin Webster at season's end and also not being able to tip off during the 2020 tournament due to COVID game cancellations. I, I appreciate what this group has been kind of going through, but I still have this belief and faith that whatever, how many we have, we can still find a way to get it done. Although it's been five years since the Rainbow Warriors won a tournament game and the tournament itself, they're not giving up anytime soon. Senior standout Samuta Avea chose to opt out of the 2021 season. However, Coach Gannat remains confident Avea will return for 2022. He explained his decision, we supported his decision, and all he would say was that he was looking forward to returning. The Bows finished sixth in the Big West this year and an even 9-9 season, with the return of key players 
The Bulls are now looking to take their game even higher in 2022. For UHM-TV, I'm Matthew Vasconcelos. Matthew, how is the roster shaping up for 2022? As of now, there are three players transferring and one is going pro, but at least one promising star is expected to return. Hot hand sophomore forward Bernardo Da Silva. So hopefully, that could be part of the recipe for a winning season. Go Bows! Thanks, Matthew, and thank you for joining us for this 24th edition of UHMTV. For more information on any of our stories, check out the UH Manoa journalism website or visit our YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm Elizabeth Ufi. And I'm Sammy Joe Sexton. Mahalo for watching and aloha. aloha.